Sebring, 1957. All the things that are particular to Sebring. The flat, roasted countryside, broken only by shady groves of orange trees, barren cattle ranches, spotted with sickly pines, an occasional stream wandering through cypress avenues to a large, still lake. The town itself, dusty, a little more humid this year, with the pungent odor of mimosa lingering in the streets, and out-of-towners clearly marked by gallons of perspiration and exhausted faces, if not Bermuda shorts and gaudy sunglasses. The local hotel keepers, somehow retaining the aura of Victorian stolidness in their establishments, busily counting their money under lazy fans in dark lobbies. Sebring, 1957. All the things that are peculiar to Sebring. Racing cars, of course, blasting through the streets and down the roller coaster towards the track. A remarkable abundance of 300 SLs and Bentley Continentals, reviving one's faith in a rich America. Puzzled mechanics, sporting Pirelli coveralls, struggling with English, or rather American, a decidedly different breed of cat. The elusive Fangio, the effusive, busy Moss, the ever-present and always slaving Cunningham, Portago with his red and yellow practice car, the MG team doing a nice job of shopping at the AMP and bar hopping with the competition cars, Count von Tripps sporting a black and yellow Ford convertible, chopped, channeled, underslung, twin-tone mufflered, and a five-gallon Stetson, and naturally, talk, 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 in all languages. The Maserati people, who speak Italian, French, Spanish, English, and Texan, were brooding about the chances of their new 4-5 lasting the distance. Portago, with Ferrari, of course, had a few opinions on the 4-5, typically brief and definite. You think the Maserati can uh, last for 12 hours, the 4-5? No, I don't. Peter Collins, Ferrari's team leader, had little confidence in the 4-5. It's never held together yet, and personally I should be very surprised if it holds together ever. <laughs> and Phil Hill was practically skeptical. Do you think the 4-5 is going to last? I don't think so, but it might. Who knows? So, half the official Ferrari team put their individual feet squarely into it. In their defense, it must be said that there were other similar comments from other teams. Here's Mike Cawthorn of Jaguar. Um, well, I don't think the 4-5 will last the race, the big one. Jim Kimberly. Tell me, do you think this uh, four and a half liter job of Fangio can last the whole race? That, <laughs> that's the $64,000 question. Anybody can answer that question for you, better than I. Count von Trips of the Ferrari team. Then anyway, there is the 4.5 Maserati, we'll, we'll, which is uh, the... which is a, a very, very fast car. And if this car will not break down during 12 hours, I think it has the greatest chance to win the race. Speculation about the monster was not encouraging. And even Fangio himself, usually imperturbable, stern and unsmiling, reacted to leading questions about the car. Here's his answer to a question about brakes. <laughs> Uh, he expects that everything will be all right and the brakes will be okay, but because that is the, the hard scene here in this circuit. Paul O'Shea, who seems to be the only man who can do justice to a 300 SL in America, was one of the Corvette drivers. Uh, which, which, which of the cars are you driving? I'm gonna, I believe I'm going to drive this red one here. It actually hasn't been decided. What is that, uh, fuel injection? Yeah, all fuel injection. All fuel injection. Yeah. Yeah. But this is some kind of a futuristic styling on it. It's quite pretty, actually, I think. It goes quite well. Does it? Very well. Uh, what, I noticed they're running several different kinds of Corvettes here today. Can you tell us about which Well, they're running what the, a space frame car, which they're calling their SS. Uh, is that the blue one? That's the blue one inside, which is very light. Uh, it's a, a, a wonderful effort on their part. I hope they have a lot of success with it, because I think it's a great thing to have an American manufacturer get so interested in our sport. Now they're running this red one here, which is a more or less a styling car. Uh, it is modified, the engine is modified, the brakes are modified, the chassis is a modified version, and as you can see, it doesn't resemble too much of a regular looking Corvette. But it's a Corvette. <laughs> but it's a Corvette, and then they're running two absolutely production cars for the Gran Turismo, in the Gran Turismo production class. 
Uh, when do they start designing and building this SS, do you know? I really don't know that much about it, Bill. It's kind of, uh, I suppose that uh, they're going to see how they make out with this one and uh, then see where the future lays from there, I suppose. Do you know any uh, performance? On the car? On the car, any performance? Figures? I know they've gotten around here in about 3 minutes and 26 seconds, which is about 3 seconds faster than the lap record last year, which is very good. Of course, there wasn't any traffic on the road or anything, but it's still commendable. How about acceleration? That's probably pretty phenomenal, too. Acceleration is entirely up to the adhesion of the tires on the road. In other words, you can spin wheels however you want to. The suspension is very good, too, in the back, so you're getting quite a bit of traction. You know what the top speed is? Uh, actually, I don't. I would venture to say that they probably intend to run here somewhere about 145 miles an hour. Quite short straightaways here. Fairly low rear end. Probably. And put in a low rear end. I think you gain more here by forgetting about top speed and worrying more about stopping and going, you know? There's a lot of money riding on this race. I guess there is. In town, at the Pontiac garage, we spotted what appeared to be a flashy Ferrari Roadster with a low windscreen and a flimsy black top. We asked Peter Collins about it, and he explained that this was one of the team cars, complying with the new FIA regulations. There were other regulations more difficult to comply with. We've come over here, and so Maserati, on the regulations they sent to us, which don't mention anything about using the spare wheel in a uh, tire change. They now issue an appendix to the regulations, which says that the first pit stop must include the use of the spare wheel. Well, now both ourselves and Maserati have different size wheels and tires on the back as opposed to the front. So, in other words, we can't put a front wheel and tire on the back. So, as far as we're concerned, if we come into the pits with a flat back tire, we're not allowed to change it. That's rather absurd. Which is absurd, and not only that, you're not allowed to bring out an appendix to the regulations without the signed, well, at least before, within 36 hours, I think it is, of the, uh, the, re the closing of the entries. That's an FIA regulation. Yeah, that's an FIA regulation, Appendix 6, Section C. And, um, if you want, off your lawyer. <laughs> and if you want to change these things, you have to get the signature of all the concurrent, all the competitors. And if one competitor doesn't agree to it, they can't do it. Uh -huh. And we're trying to do this now. We're all pretty mad about it. Uh, when do you think it'll be resolved? Yeah, well, right now, by the noise well, Ogolini from Maserati is making. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who, who's he making that noise with? Everybody. Everybody. Uh, well, all the people that matter. You know, the Chief Fitzgerald now and Alec Ullman, I suppose, eventually. And now uh, Mr. Tavoni, who's the lawyer from Ferraris, he's going after it as well. But you see, from our point of view, um, if we carried, uh, if we came into the pits with a bent, buckled, smashed rear wheel, and we had to use as the first wheel change a spare wheel, we wouldn't be able to put it on, so we should, we should just have to stop there. But the Corvettes and all the other entries from the, um, oh, I won't state the country, have got the same size wheels on the front and back. Mm -hmm. Well, sounds like a General Motors plot. <laughs> I've been hearing a little talk that the course isn't as fast this year as it seemed to have been last year. Do you remember it all? Or do you... Yes, it doesn't seem to be so fast to me either. There's a lot of patches on it that have got much more slippery. One particularly the bottom end of the fast straight first and second fast straights, the one that divides the two up. What would account for that? Well, there's a lot of water being allowed to lie on it, it still does lie on it, and there's, when you get water lying on concrete for any length of time, it becomes, a, it, it gets covered in sort of a greeny, mossy stuff, which gets ingrown in into the concrete, and much slippery, and also the tire wear seems to have gone up a lot since last year. Um, they've resurfaced the course in one or two places, and um, there's still a lot of bad bumps, which have gone worse, I think, since last year. Um, I don't know whether it's because we're going faster or what it is, but the course seems much bumpier than it was before. Also, um, they, I don't think they have the barrels and the marker barrels in exactly the same position as they were before. One thing I'd like to say, I think, these 50-gallon oil drums they've got everywhere, uh, they ought to be burnt in hell as far as I'm concerned. I, I think they're very, very dangerous things. Because if one car hits them and another one's following, it's happened to me once the one's landed on me, and a 50-gallon oil drum is no light thing anyway. I think we could do well without those, especially when somebody gets, if they run out of brakes and have to go wide on a corner, they're going to run into straw barrels and those 50-gallon oil drums. It's a very, very bad thing. I don't. That's one thing about the course this year that I think is very, very bad indeed. Thanks, Peter. Back at the track, practice was about to begin, and waiting drivers were willing to talk. Here's Phil Hill. Phil, uh, what are you driving today, as if we didn't know? Uh, one of the works Ferrari three and a half. Uh, which one? Number 14. Is that one of the new ones? 
No, it's one of the, well, it's, it's new. The chassis is new, but the engine is uh, a modification of what we ran last year in Europe. Uh -huh. 12 cylinder. Uh, the chassis is new. Yes, the uh, chassis is new. Uh, uh, and what, uh, what uh, characteristics does it have that uh, are going to help you today? Well, they're just a little different than they were before, that's all. I mean, I couldn't really tell you. I, 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 don't, I find that I don't have the time to go into these uh, uh, things anymore. Why, you're getting to be a prima donna. <laughs> no, seriously, they're just changing all the time, and uh, I used to keep right up with what they had done when they changed the spring rate or something, but now it's just impossible. Who are you driving with? Um, on trips. Oh, the Count. Right. Uh, how do you think you're going to do today? Well, all we can do, we, we aren't as fast as the new cars, but all we can do is hope to outlast them and uh, keep plugging away. Uh, what are you lapping in, and what are the new cars lapping in in practice? Well, I'm, I'm lapping in 35 and 34 and 33, but I've, I've got another few seconds in reserve, but I think we'll probably run right around there today. Mm -hmm. And the other cars are a good three or four seconds faster. Mm -hmm. um, where do you expect <coughs> competition to come from, Maserati or uh, Corvette? Well, I'm not sure about Corvette. I wouldn't be surprised to see the Corvette well, right out front for a while. But I, 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 all we can do is just forget about them, really. You didn't they're drive it, did you? No, but they're an unknown quantity. We know that they have a few problems, like things getting so blazing hot inside the cockpit that the pilots can't stand it, things of that sort. And, uh, so all we can do is just let them uh, fall by the wayside, if they will. And friend Fangio and Moss and company, what do you expect there? Well, they'll probably be right. Up, they'll probably be up front for a while, I would expect. Mm -hmm. Or at least the one in the 4-5 will be, I think. Portago, hands on hips, cigarette between his teeth, was waiting while the mechanics fussed with his carburetors. You fellas going to take this one this year? Well, we're going to try to. Uh, which car are you driving, Fon? Number 12. That's the uh, quadruple overhead cam? Yeah, that's right, Bill. Well, can you tell me a little something about the car? Well, I don't know much about it myself. I've only driven it four laps in practice yesterday. How do you like it? Uh, it's not bad, it's all right. Uh, how are you, uh, what, what kind of speeds were you laughing at? I did uh, 328. 328. Yeah, but I wasn't pushing it very high. I think we can get down to about 324. Last year you fellas had some trouble with brakes here, didn't you? No, no. Well, we came in first and second. Yes, of course, but uh, wasn't there some brake trouble anyway? Uh, well, all brakes fade out in a 12-hour race. Uh, have you done anything about that at all? Have Our brakes are greatly improved this they year. Are. Is there any, anything specific you can tell me about the improvements? Well, the brake drums are bigger and larger in every way. Uh-huh. Uh, um, and where do you expect some of your big competition to come from today other than Fangio? Well, I think the uh, Fangio in the 4.5 Maserati and Mike Hawthorne in the D Jaguar will be in the lead for the first three or four hours. And, uh, but I think by the time the race is halfway over, we'll be back up there. Uh -huh. uh, what did you think of the... You've, um, uh, you've been seeing this SS Corvette. What do you think of that car? Well, it's a new car, and you, it's very difficult to give an opinion of it. I think it must be pretty good. Uh -huh. Did you talk to Fangio after he drove it? No, I haven't seen him. We spotted a Ferrari technician measuring the track surface temperature. Luigi Canetti, usually the one-armed paper hanger around the Ferrari pits, found a few minutes to explain this to us. Luigi, could you tell us uh, why they're doing this? Uh, Ingegnere Morotti, he say he's just too uh, conform the tire pressure to the weather condition, the, the heat of the track, the, the warm of the atmosphere, and also to adjust the carburation uh, of the engine itself. I see. And also because we know in this way the wear of the tire. The tire wear, you suppose, uh, one uh, tenth of an inch if the temperature is a, a freezing condition, and maybe two tenths of an inch if it's at, at 80 degrees. If it's 120, go by the square. So it's so important to know the, the temperature of the track itself, of the sun. I see. It's part of the... <laughs> technical preparation. That's very interesting. I see you've got nine Ferraris here, Luigi. Are you responsible for all of them? Well, as a Ferrari uh, representative uh, with uh, Natri, Mr. Ingenio Morotti, Mr. Tavonic, he's uh, becoming the factory team uh, manager. He's a very young uh, engineer of the factory. It's the first time he's uh, out of the country, but he's a very brilliant young man and sure in the future he's going to make himself well known as a team racing team manager, and we hope to have a very good result with a, a new one, uh, deficient too, in our factory for many years. How do you like that new 12, the, the new 12 cylinder quadruple overhead car? Do you like it? Uh, technically, it is very interesting, but naturally, it takes easy one full season before it becomes uh, very good. Uh -huh. 
is quite improved since the first time he raced in Argentina, but it's still a long way to, to go. Uh -huh. But behind, we have the old uh, single camshaft, very, very reliable car. And, uh, we hope this one is a car in the last 24 hours also. How many of the cars, uh, the nine Ferraris are here, are actually factory prepared and factory entered today? Uh, four. Uh -huh. uh, what, did you th what do you think of that uh, Corvette SS, that new Corvette? It's a, a car uh, really made tremendous in improvement since it started first uh, two years ago. And I'm pleased to see an American factory get, get interested, not be in our sport, not because of the sport himself only, but because I believe the engineer of the Chevrolet Corvette, a very intellig intelligent and uh, to know is only through competition you may improve not only the production of the standard car but maybe also of the army truck or tank or airplane engine that's why i, I'm, I was always interested in my life in this type of sport because besides the uh, a fun for us is also technically very very interesting for the United States of America, the largest automobile. Yes. Uh, uh, well, do you think that SS is a chance of winning? Uh, it's still an, it's still an experimental car. Not to win uh, with the with the Corvette, we needed a very very intelligent driver, and I think the actual driver they have, even being very very good, they are far from the Fangio. Uh, but he has a big possibility too. Well, thank you very much, Luigi, and good luck today. Thank you. Here's Roy Salvatore, one of the brilliant newcomers from England. Uh, Mr. Salvatore, uh, tell us something about this car you're driving today. What kind of a Maserati is it? It's a three-liter Maserati, the six-liter, three-liter. Uh, it's a very good car. First time I've driven the three-liter Maserati. Uh, where, uh, first time you've driven a three-liter. Uh, three-liter Maserati. Well. Uh, what other ones have you driven? The two-liter Sports and the Formula One car, the two-and-a-half-liter Formula One car. And who's splitting the driving with you uh, today? I'm driving with um, Carol Shelby. Carol Shelby. Um, is uh, Fangio, are Fangio and Moss going to drive that four-and-a-half-liter job? Or I, I'm not sure. Well, there are rumors that it's going to be pulled. Going to be withdrawn. Uh, I don't think that's so. Uh, you don't think that's so? No. <laughs> do you think that if it does run, do you think it can last the whole race? And that's the problem with that big one, I understand. Well, it's proved very reliable so far, but uh, it's a long race and it's a hard race here. Yes. Who else is driving for Maserati this, uh, this race? Vera, uh, Fenjo, Moss, Shell, Carol Shelby, Bunnier, Scalati, and myself. How do you like the course? Very good. A bit of each, a bit of an airdrome circuit and a bit of road, road circuit. Last year you drove here, who'd you drive with? With Carol Shelby. Uh huh. Um, tell me, where do you go from here? Back to England for uh, the Fulton Park motor race. Uh, I beg your pardon, I didn't hear you. Old Shelby <laughs> came over. Hey, come here, Carol. Get it, Get it on this, your teammate. You're driving with Salvador, aren't you? Yeah. How do, how do you like your car? Pardon? How do you like your car? Oh, pretty good. You think you're gonna beat uh, your boys, Moss and Pancho too? I don't know. We're gonna try to finish. We're gonna try to finish, of course. What do you think of that SS Corvette? Oh, it goes like stink, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, do you think it's gonna last? <laughs> that remains to be seen. You can never say that uh, in this early game. Uh, how do you? Would you like to predict this race? Um, what do you think the um, the real? I say there's is more luck in this race than any race in the world. So it's too difficult to try to predict. Uh, tell me this. Uh, has Maserati made uh, special precautions on their brakes this year? Yes. They uh, have. Can you tell me what they've done? They've taken the big 4.5 liter brakes and put them on the 3 liter cars. Mm -hmm. Do you think those 3 liters are going to be able to stay with the 3.5 liters that Prairie has? Well, I'm not so sure on sheer speed, but at the end of 12 hours, I believe they'll be there. Mm -hmm. Well, the very best of luck to you, Carol. Nice seeing you. Thank you again. Baron von Hanstein, who won the Targa Florio last year and who manages Porsche teams, told us about his entries. Yeah, Mr. Von Heinstein. Is that the correct, correct pronunciation? Yes, exactly. Mr. Von Heinstein, can you tell me something? You want to be very correct, it's Baron Von Heinstein. Baron Von Heinstein. Well, don't, don't bother about the Baron. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Baron Von Heinstein, tell me, if you will, please, something about your team. How many cars are you running? We are running two factory cars. One uh, Spyro RS-type Targa Florio, 
and another and the uh, scoop standard coupe Carrera coupe. Uh -huh. And apart from that, we have uh, four uh, American customers in the race. I see, and you're supporting them, of course. In, with, with we the are pen. giving some uh, technical and advice and I see. help as far as we can. Uh, tell me, who are driving the uh, two factory teams, the two factory cars? Well, the, uh, on the S file, we're having the German champion Hans Hermann to start with, to, uh, and I should be polite and put, should say Jack McAfee first because he's our guest. So we had an uh, American champion Jack McAfee and Hans Hermann, American and German champions of their 1500cc class. Right. And in the second car, it was meant to be uh, Johan from Guatemala who has been driving quite a lot for us, and our first Mac engineer, Herbert Linge. As Johan didn't turn up, apparently he didn't get an American visa. Uh, I have to jump in myself, and uh, so I'm going to drive the Carrera. Oh, well, very good. But now one more question, if I may. I know it's not in the same class that you're running, but I'm sure you've been watching this General Motors product, this uh, SS they've been running out here. What do you think of it? I think that G G General Motors, uh, and especially uh, uh, Arkus Dunter, who, uh, for, as far as I know, is looking into it, has done a wonderful job. We are, I can't tell you how happy we were in Europe when uh, a, a big American concern like General, like General Motors took up racing. Because that has given a new, imp a new impulse to the whole uh, sports car racing. And uh, I would be uh, very happy if the uh, Chevrolet has a chance of, play of, of getting a good position in the race, although I know that for the first time uh, it, it might be a little bit difficult for them, but I really hope that all the effort they have done will be deserved, uh, will deserve a good place and they will have it. And uh, I wish uh, Corvette the best of luck possible. We couldn't agree with you more. We're, uh, in fact, we're hoping that maybe General Motors is going to bring Mercedes-Benz out of retirement. They'll have to come back with something. Yeah, that might be, it. That might be the idea. It's, if it's a big concern like that, goes into racing, the other one has to follow. Well, thank you very, very much, and the very best of luck to you to tomorrow. It has been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Very much. Here's Dave Ash, the boss man of the MG team. Uh, Dave, can you tell us what's happening to your team this year? Well, we seem to be in good shape. We hope, naturally, to be able to be lucky enough to repeat what we did last year, namely the team win. Cars are all right, and we're all keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, would you mind telling... Uh, our listeners, how you won last, how you finished last year with well, beautiful. As you remember, we pulled the cars in about 10 minutes before the end, and they lapped together and finished abreast. It was quite a sight. We were all very proud of it. It sure was. Tell me, uh, are these strictly uh, production cars? Absolutely. Uh, they have a few little things done to them, like different brake linings and so on, which a factory makes optional for racing, and anybody can buy. Uh, how many cars are you running? There are three cars uh, in the team, one from Canada, one from Washington, D.C., and one from New York, our car. Now, could you tell us who's driving each car? How yeah, you... Gus and I, I'm team captain. Gus is uh, number... Gus. Gus Airman is number two man. On the second car, Steve Spittler and Bill Kinchelow, and on the third car, Roly Keith and Ed Levins from Canada. Now, in your class, where do you expect your competition? Only from Porsche. There's one fast car in that class, but it's a new car, and we hope that we can push him make him break himself up. <laughs> well, very best of luck to you, Dave. And All thank right. Thank you very much. You bet. Bye. Bye. Colin Chapman is very likely the most brilliant designer in England today, and his Lotus cars have enjoyed success the world over. Here he is with one of his drivers, Doc Wiley. Well, uh, we've got four of the new Lotus 11 cars running this year. They're similar to the cars that we ran experimentally last year, but they've been developed quite a bit since then. Three of them are 1100s, and there's one 1500 driven by Doc Wiley and uh, uh, Charles Moran and his wife Peggy here. Um, they're all basically the same engine, a single overhead cam Coventry Climax, and the 1500 is an overboard version of this same engine. Uh, we obviously hope uh, in our uh, category, apart from trying to do well in our class, we are hoping to get a fairly high index figure, and uh, we're trying for the index of performance. Uh, Doc Wiley, tell me, where do you expect competition in your class to come from today? Well, of course, we always expect it from the Porsche team, who are both fast and reliable. We have an Oscar and a Maserati, but uh, we're the only British car in Class F. And, of course, being British myself, I shall do my best to uphold the prestige, not to mention <laughs> Collins' prestige. And uh, we trust that if the car goes the way our 1100 did last year, 
spite of a might of difficulty towards the end, while we shall be more than satisfied. How did you break this place, Monsieur? Well, last year we had a little breakthrough at boiling, but this year we have some very high boiling point fluid, 420, and we trust that that at least will not recur. Colin himself has adapted the car so the cooling is better, and I think that too will be under adequate control. Uh, tell me, uh, Colin, how, what do you think of this SS Corvette that's out here? Well, I think it's a, it's a very good sign. I only hope it means that American uh, car industry is going to take up sports car racing seriously because I do feel there's a tremendous amount of prestige to be gained in this sphere, but, uh, particularly if they adopt the European style of racing, which it appears uh, that they are going to. The car of it itself is of a very advanced design and has been beautifully ca uh, carried out, and I can see that these lads here are getting a lot of experience in this type of racing uh, preparatory to making an onslaught in Europe. Doc, do you think the uh, do you think that Corvette's going to finish the race? Well, the highly experimental one, I wouldn't bet on it. But with pitch driving, of course, it has a chance. But the fuel injection, ordinary ones, I suspect, will do very well, and will have a tremendous battle with the Mercedes Benzes. Though I would uh, again watch Jack McAfee in the and Linger in the Porsche Coupe, the 1600 Coupe, which has been going like a bomb and may well beat in the Grand Touring class cars of very much larger capacity, including even the Corvettes. Well, thank you very much, both of you, and the very, very best of luck to you here today. And of course, the champ himself, looking somewhat ridiculous with his badge reading, driver. How do you like the new Maserati? How do you the new Maserati? Habrá que saber ahora si aguanta, ¿no? Si resiste. Pero dice que él ha esperado que va a ser ever since. Ok, ¿no? Bien. ¿Qué tipo de horas de horas ha estado haciendo en el Maserati? Lap times. ¿Cuánto rápido ha estado haciendo en la pista en práctica? Sí. Él quería saber cuál es el mejor tiempo en la pista. Sí, sí, sí. Sí, sí. Sí, uh -huh. uh, would you ask um, ask him what he thinks of the SS Corvette? Uh, he says that the Corvette is a good uh, car and he thinks that will be the winner too here. Uh, Half chance. Could, could be. Could be the winner. That's right. Could be the winner. Huh? Uh, would you ask? Uh, would you ask one more question? Uh, what his plans are for the rest of the year for racing? Who he expects to race with? Yeah, the compromise is uh, form number one in all the year with the Maserati. And what about sports cars? No, yo no es. Yo vine aquí porque aquí probamos una, un nuevo producto. Eh, Vitalite se llama. Uh -huh. Por eso vine, porque me interesa. Dice que he uh, come here to take a new product, Vitalite. That is the name. According to that, he is here. Fine. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Much love. Count von Trips was wandering around the pits, looking rather lost. And here's our good friend, the Count von Trips, who is driving today for the Commendatore Ferrari. Yes, for the old man Ferrari, as we used to say. The old man Ferrari. Old man Ferrari, that's the expression. <laughs> oh, that must be a beloved expression. <laughs> uh, yeah, we like him. He's a nice, nice, nice man. Well, tell me, uh, what car are you driving today? I'm driving one of the 12 cylinders, one of the last year's cars with the two overhead camshafts. And um, it runs very well, and it's, uh, it's not as... Uh, fast as the new one, but it uh, probably will stand the whole race. Mm -hmm. You think the new ones might not take the whole race? Oh, yes, they might, you know, but you never know if it's a new car. We had it in Argentine, but down there it was so hot, uh, so uh, the car didn't work out, out very well because the uh, training uh, in Italy is, can't be compared with the race down there where the degrees were double as high as in uh, back home, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, this is now, let's say, more or less the first time where they really get into action, and we will find out. Who's your co-pilot today? I'm uh, with Phil Hill. You 
pleased, I would gather. Oh, yes. I think he's very good for a race like this. He is said to be very soft on the car, and he's not g going hard on brakes. And uh, if there is someone who will bring the car over the 12 hours, it would be him, I should say. And therefore, I'm quite pleased to be uh, able to drive with him together. Uh, tell me, have you ever driven with Phil Hill before? No, I haven't driven with him, but I have uh, been in the same race with him, and he won just before my nose, so to say, in the Grand Prix of uh, Sweden, which was my first uh, start on a Ferrari sports car. So he was driving with Trintignant, wasn't he? He was driving with Trintignant, that's mm -hmm. right. And who were you with? I was with Peter Collins. Peter Collins. Mm -hmm. um, in your own team today, uh, considering that you do not have the best cars here, you, you fail, uh, which of the other two cars do you think stand the chance of, um, of winning the race, perhaps, or both? This is very difficult to say this year, because we saw last year that the Jaguars have been very, very fast, and they had a chance to do it when they were not running out of brakes. So I think they will have done something, and the brakes will be better, and we will find out what they're doing. On the other side, there are the uh, Corvettes, which are uh, really in, in, a, in a tremendous uh, speed around this track here. Uh, they were driven by Fangio well, but the uh, other drivers, the American drivers, Pitch and uh, who it will be, they are even good, and uh, we will wait and find out how they will stand the course. Then there are the Maseratis, which uh, is the one, the 4.5, driven by Moss and uh, Fangio, as far as I know. No, not Moss. Not more? Fangio. Oh. I don't know who's driving with Fangio, but Moss is driving a three-liter. Oh, I, I didn't know that. They change that very often. And yes, there are the three-liters and two-and-a-half-liters Maseratis, which are very good. Which are very good on the road and even uh, powerful to do fast laps. And uh, so there are, let's say, more or less four makes of cars and four different uh, kind of cars which are able to uh, to win the race, you know. And therefore, it's very, diff uh, very, very interesting for all of us to see what's tomorrow night at 10 o'clock uh, going on here on that spot we were just standing now. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, do you think? Um well, do you think you have any chance at all of winning, you and Phil? Considering oh, no. Uh, you, you, look, you, you never can say this. You never can say this, you know, because uh, when everything else will break down and burn out the engine or something will happen, then maybe that our old car will win, you know. But I don't believe in it, you know. And, and I think for me myself, I like it much more going into a race just like this, you know, and say, OK, do it, and you will have fun, and you will have a nice race, and don't think about maybe winning it. It's much better you know, because if you are, let's say, in a car where everybody says this will be the winning car, then you are nervous and you are ambitious and you are keen and you drive like mad maybe. And so we will have a, a good ride and we, we try to finish the race. And well, let's say when we are over the first half of the race and we see that cars get tired and sick in the front, then we maybe push forward. And But I should say, no, I, I don't believe there is a chance for us. At the Maserati pits, lap times were being excitedly discussed by Moss, Harry Shell, Carl Shelby, and Roy Salvatore. And then you, you lose a lot of time. You, you better pick it up to 6,000 and you break it. Oh, the fee is what I'm talking about, sir. Oh, well, you just sit there. There's nothing you can do. You lose at least three seconds, then. Don't you think so? Yeah, I think so. So you do 332, you do 329, 28. That's not very good. Anyway. What is it now? I don't know. What are the others doing? 333, the track. I think the track's slow. Yeah, I'm saying. Let's not doing the big one. We finally drew Moss away from the group. Well, let's get around to your car, that four and a half liter. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not driving the four and a half liter. I'm driving a three liter. What is, has it been withdrawn? Pardon? Has the four and a half liter been withdrawn? No, no, no. Fangio and Barrow are driving it. Oh, I see. We switched drivers. Um, I. I know it's the fastest car here because I think it would do 3 minutes 20 quite easily, uh, which is a lot faster than the 3-litre, but um, I've done an awful lot of running with the 3-litre and have more confidence perhaps in its chances of finishing. Mm -hmm. I may be wrong, it may, the 4.5 may finish, I hope it does. And you're really gambling points um, this time, aren't you? Yeah, it's a gamble. We 
you notice that when you and Pancho are on the same car, neither one of you could uh, make much progress on the other as far as the international point standings go. Uh, but this way, why, it's quite a race even within the uh, within the team. No, we, shall, we won't race within the team. I mean, uh, I want to win the race, he wants to win it, and the main thing is that uh, Maserati should win it. As far as I'm concerned, I've got a rev limit which I intend to stick to. And if people pull away, or if I pull away, or whatever happens, that's the way I intend to run the, my race. Are the brakes any different this year? From the yes, we've got year? four and a half litre brakes on the three litre car, uh -huh. uh, which does make a very big difference. Whether they'll last or not, I can't tell you, but it certainly stops. Yes. Um, what other observations do you have about your competition? Uh, how's Ferrari going? Well, I believe the Ferrari has got a 3.8 litre, two of them, in fact. They're going very fast. I think they've got a very strong team. I really don't know so much, you know, the race like this so much does depend on on consistency of one driver to the other and so on that uh, it's too early to make any, any idea, uh, you know, guess at what might happen. Perhaps it all sounds pretty grim, this devotion and dedication to motor racing and cars, but there are moments of levity. And here we are with the, with the Ferrari yo-yo team. Would you care to give a play-by-play -play description of this fun? Well, we're terribly worried about our ability to work the yo-yo. We're not thinking about the race yet. Where but do you expect the competition to come from in the international yo-yo competition? Well, I think Peter Collins and uh, Olivier Jean de Bien are the two best <laughs> men on the yo-yo. I don't see you working well. You must have done a lot of secret practice. I'm tired right now. Right. What do you think of the Corvette yo-yo team? <laughs> well, you know, they've got a lot of horsepower. <laughs> and indeed, the whole Ferrari team had equipped themselves with yo-yos and were diligently practicing. No race would be complete without Jaguars, and Briggs Cunningham is the man who makes them run. Briggs, how does this Jaguar team of yours look today? Well, they're all running on six right now. That's about all I want to say on that. Uh, well, tell us who's... They're not as fast as some of the other cars. That's, you know, they're a little bit old and not quite as modern and... Uh, and a little more reliable. Well, we hope. Uh, tell me, have you uh, solved the brake problem that uh, was the bane of your existence last year? I don't know. We're going to find out today, I think. Do you have different brakes? We have changeable brakes on the fronts, but not on the rears. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can change the fronts, but the rears have got to go 12 hours. Well, I understand some of the uh, corners have been changed slightly on this track uh, from last year. Have you noticed that, and will that make any appreciable difference to your brake wear? I don't think so, no. They haven't been changed enough to make that much difference. I see. Tell me, who's, uh, what, what's the lineup of, you, of your team? Who's driving which cars and what combinations? Well, Bill Lloyd and myself are driving six, and Walter Hanskin and Russ Boss are driving seven. And Mike Hawthorne and Ivor Bueb are driving five. Mm -hmm. uh, is any one of those cars um, specially tuned or more highly tuned or in any way? Uh, Number five is a later car. It was the car that the factory ran at Le Mans last year with the fuel injection and the quick change brakes on both front and rear. And that's the only one I know of that type. Are you planning to go through on one set of tires? You're going to uh, change several times. I don't think we can do more than about two hours on a set of tires. You're going to have about, figuring now. about six ch tire changes? I think we'll have quite a few as the way it's... We're planning on that to start. I we're see. planning on probably not over 40 laps anyway. Wow. That's, that's according to the rate of wear we've had in practice. Of course, mm -hmm. after the cars lay some rubber on the corner, it won't be too bad, but... Yeah. It's going to be very hot today. Uh, we're I'm afraid we're going to use tires. Tell me, what do you think of this uh, SS Corvette that everybody's talking about? Looks very nice. I've never driven it, but it certainly looks good. They're certainly on the right track, I think, with the chassis and suspension, and uh, I just hope it stands up now for 12 hours. Yes, indeed. And of course, Mike Hawthorne, replete with spotless white shirt and black bow tie. Tell me, Mike, what do you think of the Jags you're driving today? Um, well, they're much faster than they were last year, and I hope these new Dunlop brakes, they'll um, be able to put up with the bashing we give them. We've uh, got changeable pads this year, which uh, we hadn't got last year, and so when, when they're worn out, we'd had it, but I think we'll be all right this year. Uh, where do you expect most of the competition to come from? Oh, well, Maserati and Ferrari, obviously. Of course. Uh, any special cars, especially in that Maserati crew? But um, the three litres, which Sterling Moss is driving, I think that'll be well up. And, of course, the three and a half litre Ferraris will be there all the time. Uh, tell me, uh, where are you racing after you leave here? You haven't been doing as much as uh, you used to race. No, well, um, that was last year when I was BRM. The thing never ran, so I <laughs> never had a chance to race. But I'm with Ferrari this year, so I um, hope to get a lot more racing in. Oh, very good. The very best of luck to you, Mike. Thank you very much. But talk is, after all, only talk.
and has very little to do with lap times. Lap times are the result of practice. Practice, practice, practice. Two D Jags seem to do an excessive amount of running up and down. Here's one of the Corvettes out practicing.
March 23, 1957. Race day. Beginning at 8 o'clock, with the sun slanting in low over the hangars, the sleepy crowds beginning to mull about, wandering through the pit area, the tension begins to build. By 9 o'clock, frenzied officials are dashing around on motor scooters, and drivers are beginning to take up frozen positions near the cars, waiting. By 9.30, the loudspeaker has begun to broadcast urgent last-minute messages.
Portado and, and, and uh, my dear friend Tarufi will listen to me. I'll be very short. And Mr. Cunningham, attention please. I have something very brief and short to say. You're all experienced drivers. You don't need any briefing. You know what you're doing. Remember, passing right and passing left on this course is permitted. Slower cars will all bear to the right and stay out of the way. And remember, practically speaking, there's 65 starters and 64 are really slow, aren't they? So let's all think of that. You may position for turns wherever you wish, but always have due consideration for the fellow behind. I specially plead with the slower cars that they should watch the rear mirror. We do not want to have an accident here. I know everybody understands that. One more thing, we'll give you synchronized stop time, and when Mr. Lane, who will start you off, will be counting from 10 down to zero, and that will give also your chronometer a chance to set their watches correctly. Uh, I have to make an announcement that the Ferrari entered erroneously car number 11. Is at 2, 11 and 12. The information was withheld, but thanks to the interference of the FIA stewards, they insisted to divulge their correct displacement, and it is 3,800cc. 3,800cc for cars 11 and 12. Monsieur les conducteurs de voitures plus lentes, je vous prie de bien faire attention et de maintenir votre position à droite quand on vous, vous fait doubler. N'oubliez pas que nous ne voulons pas avoir un accident. Je suis tout à fait persuadé que les conducteurs de voitures plus lentes savent bien le règlement. Je vous prie de nouveau de suivre attentivement votre miroir rétroviseur. I wish you all a good race. I want to remind you, drivers, we're all meeting this evening when this little affair is over, and we hope then to exchange pleasant remarks. And I wish you good speed. Alex, Avanti. Alex, where will the start be given from? The start will be given in the center right here, so that gentlemen starting from over there and over here will have to see the signal in the center. In the center where? where the right where I'm standing, uh, Master right. Gregory. And good luck to you, sir. Thank you. 
Already the cars are beginning to string out, the Ferraris, Jags, and Maseratis out in front, the Triumphs, MGs, Porsches stretching out behind, and the little Renault Dauphines, which look surprisingly fast, bringing up the rear. The sun is climbing higher, and already spectators are beginning to sag and hunt for shade. the SS Corvette had a bit of brake trouble a few minutes ago. Came into the pits with a good deal of rubber missing from the front tires. These were quickly changed and Fitch went on. One of the Cunningham entered Jags driven by Bill Lloyd is out already with a broken valve. Berra has just broken the old lap record with a 327. Collins is tenaciously hanging on to his lead but Berra is only two seconds behind him. The positions at this time are Collins in first place, Berra very shortly behind him, then Moss, Portago, Gregory, and Hill. Eleven thirty. John Fitch, after two stops at the pits with the SS Corvette one for tires and one to repair the distributor, is stopped out on the course now. One of the Gran Turismo Triumphs is out with a broken clutch. Just after 11, Barrow began putting the pressure on Collins, passing him on the 19th lap and setting another lap record of three minutes, 24 seconds at the same time. Noon. One of the one and a half liter Maseratis is retired with valve trouble. The SS Corvette is back in the race. Fitch changed a burnt out coil out on the course, took him about 30 minutes, and the car is now approximately 20 laps behind the leader. Some of the drivers are beginning to change around now. West Coaster Pete Lovely has replaced Paul O'Shea in the big red Corvette, which seems to be running very well, turning in laps of around 350. Bueb has taken over from Mike Hawthorne in the number five Jag. Positions at this time are Berra, maintaining a lead of one minute over Collins, who is followed by Portago, driving beautifully and moving up. Moss in fourth position and Gregory in fifth. And quickly, while Berra Chin, Hill arrives at the pits at 12.34, ahead of schedule. replenishes the car, gas and tires, and the other fusses with the carburetors.
and finally von Tripps takes off. Stop? No, our ignition failed. Oh. And we're on the second battery now with a dead generator. With about nine and a half hours to go. Yep. And that's the second, that's the second generator. That's, second generator that's been on this car in two days. So obviously something else is wrong. What do you think? I don't know. I heard you say you can only get it to a 4,000 RPM. That was why I came in. That only happened for a couple of laps. It was, it was a dead battery. No ignition. They replaced the battery? We've got two. We carry two on the car. Two systems. All you do is turn one on and turn the other off. When will you go back in? I doubt very much if I will go back in. Well, I don't, see the car. Well, I don't going. know what kind of magic they're going to perform to get the other battery up to charge again. Uh, you see? Tough luck. At 12.49, Collins comes in and hands over to Trantignon. No trouble, just a scheduled stop. fast as always. Oh yeah. Any trouble on any corners? That looks like you had a good three hours. Huh? It looks like you had a good three hours. Yeah. <laughs> okay, baby. As it happens, Collins just missed some very serious trouble in the S's. Bob Goldich, driving one of the Team Arnold Bristols, came into the S's too fast and ran off the road. The car overturned and Goldich was killed instantly. Fifteen. Barra just came in to turn over to Fangio, and the car was sent out again in about three minutes, never relinquishing its lead. A number of cars have now made their regular stops for gas, oil, tires, and driver changes. Hanskin has gone in for Boss in the other Jaguar entry, Boob still being in Hawthorne's car. Darufi has just changed with Fitch, and the SS is still in the running. The positions at this time are Fangio, Fantignon, Portago, Gregory, Moss, and Shelby, who is now beginning to move up. Correction, Musso has just gone in for Patago. One nineteen. Von Trips in after forty minutes and struggling in three languages, none of them his own, to diagnose his difficulty. Come down to a car. 
corner. I even can't shift because I can't, you know, push the throttle. Behind the corner, there's two gears, it's all right. But then it's over. You threw both batteries in. I did. May not have now. It is a typical no gas, you know. Gas. We had that trouble two years ago. The gas is drier here than it is in Italy, you know? The pump doesn't work. Oh! I noticed Von Trips is out there and you've had a chance to rest for a minute. Uh, how does the car look? How's it holding up? Well, uh, we, I th either the generator or the voltage regulator has failed at this point. And uh, I think we have both uh, in the spare parts kit, uh, I think. We're on the second battery now, the spare battery. But uh, the brakes seem to be about the touchiest problem. What's, what's with the brakes? Uh, it takes a, they seem to be holding up, but they take a tremendous amount of strength to push them. Uh -huh. you know, we had the same experience in Sweden last year. Only Plantignol and I weren't strong enough to push the brakes hard enough to hurt them, and so our brakes lasted and we won. That's about the way it worked. Oh, what you want to do is um, some sitting up exercises or something. Well, I haven't been doing setting up for exercises. I've been doing some deep knee bends with about 100 pounds on my back. Literally? Yeah, honestly. For how long? Oh, I've been doing it about a month and a half now, just to build up my upper leg muscles. And it seems to have worked because I could go on indefinitely the way this car is today. And all the other drivers are complaining very bad. Fantastic. I've never heard of anyone doing that before. Well, I, I, I had this terrible time at Sweden that I, I, I'm sure that they'd be the same way. Uh -huh. I'm sh I think Ferrari's probably the last ones to go to boosters of one sort or another. And so uh, I, I've been doing these leg exercises very conscientiously. And I've got tremendously strong legs now. I could push that brake pedal about... I think I pushed it 200 pounds worth all day long. Two o'clock, more cars falling by the way. One of the Porsches is out with gearbox trouble. The Cuban D-Jaguar, the bright yellow one, is out with engine trouble. And the Jack Ensley D-Jaguar has just retired with a broken axle. The SS Corvette has finally given up. Overheating problems could not be remedied. Roy Salvatore has just taken over from Carl Shelby, and their Maserati is going along nicely now in seventh position. At 1.48, Wacky Arnold withdrew the remaining two Arnold Bristols due to the fatal accident of Bob Goldidge. At this point, Fangio is still leading, with a comfortable lead over Sterling Moss, still driving his Maserati. Shell must be getting impatient. Collins dropped back to third position, Portago to fourth. Hawthorne is now making his bid for position, having moved up to fifth. And Lou Brero Sr. in Maston Gregory's Ferrari is holding down sixth nicely. o'clock. 
15 cars are out of the race, and the remainder, probably figuring they'll make it through now, are settling down to the steady grind. Fangio is still well in the lead, and at the Maserati pit, many breaths are being held. So far, the car hasn't missed a beat. Moss finally stopped to let Shell drive, thereby dropping back to seventh and letting Musso, now subbing for Portago, into second place. Hawthorne is holding down third now, Gregory fourth. At 2.40, Brero came into the pit suffering from heat prostration, and Gregory took the wheel. But Brero seems to have recovered now. Plantignon is fifth, and despite difficulties which are building up rapidly, Von Trips is hanging on to sixth position. This is probably the hottest part of the day, and just about everybody, except the drivers, is seeking shade, a rare and much valued commodity at this time. Orange juice and beer sales are at a peak. Six. Von trips into the pit, still in trouble, but retaining his sense of humor. goes Phil to try his luck. Portago comes in with brake troubles, apparently serious, noting the silence. The mechanics fuss for about five minutes, evidently without much success, so Fon gets in and goes off.
ball. We see you're still in the running, but the SS isn't. Can you tell us uh, what happened to that big one? Wait a minute. Which happened to, what happened to which one? To the SS. Uh, the SS is still in the I really don't know. I guess they had brake troubles or something. They weren't stopping so well. Uh-huh. I know they were out once with a distributor, distributor trouble, ignition trouble, and I guess that wasn't... Yeah, but they fixed that. Yeah. John Fitch had to stop on the side of the road and fix that. Uh, now tell me, how's your car running? It's running quite satisfactorily. Now, I just came in. We're having a little brake trouble, too. Mm -hmm. It's quite heavy, you know. Yeah. What position are you in? Do you have any idea? I don't know where we are. I guess we're in the first 15 somewhere. Oh, fine. Uh, you have to wear the car's running? Yeah, it's, it's quite a fast car. As long as we can keep stopping it, we'll be all right. <laughs> Boy, this is a long race. <laughs> Brakes are beginning to give out for everyone, except, of course, the 4.5 Maserati, which is going as fast as ever and building up a substantial lead. At five minutes to four, Mike Hawthorne comes in with a D-Jag. In six minutes, the mechanics change the brakes. It was brake failure that ruined Hawthorne's wonderful drive last year, and Buob goes off. Alfred Momo is duly proud of this brake chain. How the jack went today? They're really pretty good at this present time. We just had number five in. And we really lined the brakes. It took exactly six minutes and three seconds. Oh, that's fabulous. Where are your cars running right at this minute? Uh, the present, I do not know. One, I think, is in sixth position. The other was in second. After this speed stop, I do not know what position it is. Are these brakes the answer to last year's problem? Uh, I think so. I think this will give us a little advantage over the other field. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, uh, how many cars did you enter? We entered three cars. And how many are still running? Two. What happened to the other one, Alfred? <laughs> he dropped a valve. Dropped a valve. And is who's, uh, which car, uh, which is the, uh, who's driving the cars that are in now? Uh, Ross Boss, um, Walter Hesgen, uh, Bob, and, uh, At four o'clock, the halfway point, 17 cars have officially retired from the race, and many look and sound as though they wouldn't last much longer. The little two-cylinder DB, which is usually so reliable and does so well on index, is out with a broken valve. Two Porsche Spiders have moved up into ninth and tenth spots. Banjo is still leading. Mast and Gregory doing a wonderful job is two laps behind, with Bueb in the Jag a lap behind him. Musso is holding down fourth, Collins fifth. The sun is beginning to drop now and the heat to diminish a little. The crowd is settling down for the long grind into the night. Fangio comes in, the car is refueled, the tires are changed, and Barra goes back into the race. The big red Corvette comes in for a five, and then an eight minute pit stop for brake adjustment. Over in the Maserati pits, Carol Shelby is looking a little sad. Carol, that's about uh, almost uh, seven hours of the race is over. Uh, how are you fellas making out here at Maserati? Oh, Maserati's in the lead as far as I know, Bill. Uh, which car is in front? The 4-5, uh, driven by Fangio and Barra. Uh-huh, and uh, where's Morris Lamb? I don't know. Nobody knows right now. Now, neither do we. That's what we're asking you. <laughs> and what happened to your car? How are you doing? Well, we seem to be doing quite well, and uh, I ran out of gas, came in, and we had a little difficulty in the pit. You, you know, there's a rule that you have to go 20 laps between times you put gas in the car. Yeah. We forgot and went three, so they disqualified the car. Oh, so you're out of the race. Yeah. Oh, it's too bad, Carol. But uh, things look good for Maserati today, don't they? Fairly good. Yeah. This stage, but anything can happen. <laughs> it's that 11th it's that 11th come. hour. Dan Gelfi, keeper of the 4-5, is gloating. Uh, here's Dan Gelfi, uh, one of the uh, probably the finest Maserati mechanic in the United States. Hey, what's the matter, Dan? Uh, all right, just one question. We noticed a lot of pure castor oil. Uh, are you mixing this with castor oil, or how are you using it? Uh, no, we are using it fully. Full castor. Full castor oil. Yeah, castor oil. Um, As a matter of fact, we had to get some from. Uh, 
uh, a wholesale chemistry or a drugstore in Tampa. It came down by coach yesterday uh, afternoon. Why do you decide to use pure castor oil? Because uh, we expected uh, some kind of a hotter weather. And, uh, we thought we would run in difficulties with the uh, oil that we generally uh, uh, use in uh, Europe. We thought the, the weather would be uh, around 100 instead it's, uh, what is it, 75 or something? Eh? Our oil temperature is around, uh, I'd say, 225, 230 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, are you satisfied with the way the cars are running on the oil? Uh, yes, we don't use much oil. We uh, put some at, uh, when we refuel, you see, but uh, that's only a precaution. And, uh, uh, the car wouldn't uh, really need any, you see. But we, uh, th that's a procedure uh, uh, in order to... How is that four and a half liter? I never thought it would run so nice. Uh, yes, really, really, really. I didn't think it had that much guts. Uh, it really goes. Well, how the brakes hold? The brakes, uh, just uh, an hour and a half ago, we pulled them in for gas, and then uh, we uh, adjusted the brakes the front brakes, but uh, they didn't take much adjusting, and the pedal is nice and solid. We got plenty of them. We got lots of them. At 4.34, Hill and Glen Trips give up a well-fought battle, more against their car than against the competitors. After a routine pit stop, the car refuses to start and is officially retired. Five o'clock, Barra still two laps ahead of Gregory, and Bueb still one lap behind him. Musso in fourth, and Moss, after a pit stop that cost him several laps, back up in fifth. Six o'clock. Collins came in briefly a few minutes ago for a Coke. Things settle down a bit as the sun drops lower and becomes a vision hazard. Moss, heading into the hairpin, raises his goggles, shielding his eyes with one hand, negotiates the corner as smoothly as ever, and lowers his goggles, accelerating up the straight. The Gran Turismo Ferrari, driven by Jean de Bien and Greenspun, retired with a broken crankshaft, Greenspun pushing it the better part of a mile to the pits. By seven o'clock, the routine driver changes have taken place. O'Shea has gone in for Pete Lovely in the number two Corvette. Shell in for Moss in the third place Maserati. Lantignon for Collins, Portago for Musso, Hawthorne for Bueb, Brero back for Gregory after about 40 minutes. Don't know why. It's almost dark now. The lights are on in the pit area and the cars are cutting bright streaks through the night. The four five Maserati, still in the lead, has three headlights which on the straights grow coming at you and diminish going away with alarming speed. It hasn't missed a beat all afternoon. Hawthorne has put on the pressure and passed Portago into second place, Shell having dropped back to fourth place. Brero is in fifth and the Hanskin boss car in sixth. The new Testarossa Ferrari driven by Richie Ginter and Howard Hively has begun to move up steadily. 
It has been sleeping, so to speak, all afternoon, but has now passed two of the Porsches into eighth place. A sort of lethargy has come over the pit area. The 4-5 Maserati is going on, Fangio at the wheel, and people seem just to be waiting for either the end of the race or something to happen to the car. The positions are unchanged since 7 o'clock, Fangio, Hawthorne, Portago, Shell, but now Hanskin passing Brero into fifth. Total darkness now and getting a bit chilly. Fangio still out there. Now four laps ahead of the nearest car. Moss, making his last minute bid, has moved up into second. Hawthorne, after a stop for tires and gas, is in third. And Maston Gregory has come back into fourth. Hanskin is in fifth, with Collins sixth. Portago came into the pits at about eight o'clock and spent a half an hour there with evidently gas line trouble. A great pity, since he and Musso have driven such a brilliant race. Collins' car seems almost out of brakes now, turning in laps of close to four minutes. The little Porsches have made their effort and have forced the Ginther Hively Ferrari out of the first ten, holding eighth, ninth, and tenth themselves now. They also have the index prize sewed up and have since about four o'clock this afternoon. Fangio comes in for gas. In their rush, the mechanics spill a good deal onto the flimsy seat of the car. Fangio stands waiting patiently while mechanics and pit manager tear their hair out finding another. Then he calmly gets in and goes off. He still has a lead of four laps. Time and the 4-5 move on relentlessly, and 10 o'clock finds Fangio still out front. Moss has come in a neat second, making up two of his four laps just near the end. Mike Hawthorne third, he and Bueb having proved a remarkable team again. Vera looks immensely pleased, as well he should, having driven every bit as fast and reliably as the master. Gregory, having driven a magnificent race with Lou Brero, is fourth. With the other jag, the Hanskin boss car fifth. Collins and Trantignon have brought their breakless wonder into sixth, with the hard luck Portago and Musso seven. Two of the three Porsches have gotten eighth and ninth, the third having retired at 9.30 with transmission failure, and the Ginther Hively Testarossa tenth. 
On index, the Porsches naturally have the first two places, with Colin Chapman and Shepard third in their Lotus. Moss, Shell, fourth, and the 4.5, fifth. So, another Sebring is over. The fireworks have gone up, the car has been carted away, and tons and tons of loose paper and orange juice cartons are the only inhabitants of the course. But the results have meaning. The Maserati 4.5 has performed magnificently and virtually trouble-free, and promises to provide an exciting season. The Ferraris proved a disappointment, and Commendatore is no doubt pondering this. The Jags put in their usual sterling performance, and the Porsches and MGs outdid themselves as usual. The little Renault sedans crossed the line three abreast, having done a remarkable job. But to most of us, Sebring is sound. It was nice this year to hear the V12 Ferraris back, a startling experience to hear the new 4.5 Maserati. Refreshing to hear the now familiar Jags and Maseratis, the Lotuses, MGs, Porsches, Triumphs, Healy's, and all the exciting sounds that characterize this incredibly exciting sport. Nobody knows what next year will bring, but we can be sure it will be as thrilling in its own way as this year was.